I'm going to skip over the business of self as a theory of oneself because I want to talk about um, uh, the other kind of knowledge structure that's relevant to the self-concept, which is the perception-based uh, representation of the self. And remember, perception-based representations are like mental images. So if the self is your mental representation of yourself, and mental representations can take two broad forms, meaning-based, largely verbal representations, or perception-based, largely imagistic representations. We've just talked about the self-concept as an example of a meaning-based uh, representation of the self. Let's talk about the self-image as a perception-based representation of oneself. And again, in colloquial terms, self-image usually means self-esteem. Oh, he's got a bad self-image, okay? Which means he thinks bad thoughts about himself or something like that. We're not talking about self-esteem here. Again, the goal is to make progress in, uh, in, in, uh, conceptually by being very, very concrete. Talk about self-image as the image that we have of ourselves. Psychoanalysts from the early 20th century, uh, uh, the shoulder, uh, define the self-image in exactly that way. The picture of our own body, which we form in our mind, the way in which our body appears to ourselves. Again, not our body as it would be physically measured, say, in the doctor's office, not our bodies as they appear to other people, but our bodies as they appear to ourselves. That's what the, you know, the self-image is all about from a cognitive point of view. And it's pretty clear we have one. It's clear we have one in part because we have perception-based representations of other people as well. We close your eyes, think about your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your mother, your father, your dog, your cat. Oh, there's my cat. Okay, fedora, just fine. Right. Um, we have these images in our head that represent what people look like, okay? uh, that, that actually uh, that re reflect their physical features. We have auditory images in our heads. We carry around auditory images of what other people sound like. Somebody calls you on the phone and says, hi, it's me. Okay? Well, what are you supposed to do with that? Right? Okay. Um, if, if you're like most people, you know more than one other person. Right? You're supposed to recognize who that person is on the phone, and you do. And the, the way you can recognize them is not by looking at the phone and, and recognizing their phone number the way you can on some cell phones, uh, but because you have internalized a perception-based representation uh, of, uh, of their voices. We make judgments of other people based purely on visual information, uh, visual information that reflects their, their relative age or their gender or their relative uh, power relations, like in the baby face of uh, this literature. And we know that uh, we, we can extract information from, uh, from people's faces. Uh, so we, we know we have perception-based representations of other people. It stands to reason that we have perception-based representations of ourselves. The British physiologist Henry Head uh, referred to uh, uh, our internal representations of our bodies in terms of the body schema. He argued that you had to have in your head some kind of postural model of your body in order to, to engage in any kind of behavioral activity, like walking or swimming or just moving around uh, in, uh, uh, in, in space, and that we can distort these, uh, these perceptual representations of ourselves in various ways. For example, in the famous prism adaptation experiments, you put prisms, uh, the prism lenses on people that uh, distort space so that when they're looking uh, uh, forward, they're actually looking at a piece of space that's 45 degrees off here. So, okay, well, I want you to reach for this object and they reach here. They don't find it because it's really over here, right? And people can adjust over a period of time. They can learn uh, where their bodies are uh, in space. We have some internal representation of our body and its parts and where they are. And that's the beginning of the self-image viewed as an image, not as a euphemism for self-esteem. Here's a really nice example of the, of the experiment that shows that we do have something like a perception-based representation of ourselves, as well as perception-based representations of other people in their heads. If you had intro with me, you've, you've heard me talk about this uh, uh, experiment before. It's one of my Faustian experiments, one of those experiments that I would sell my soul to have done myself. It's a really clever um, experiment um, uh, based on uh, what, uh, what Robert Zions called the mere exposure effect. Okay? Mere exposure effect simply says that we tend to prefer things we've been exposed to frequently in the past. That's all it is. Okay? Um, but what Mita and her colleagues did uh, was to uh, do a demonstration of the mere exposure effect with people's facial images. What she did was uh, to take uh, head-on photographs of uh, college students and their friends, and then she, uh, basically using Photoshop, though it was 1977, it wasn't Photoshop, uh, reversed half of the images so that they were the, mirror, uh, the, the reversed mirror image. Okay? And then she simply presented people with photographs of themselves and of their friends and asked them to pick out which one they preferred. Okay? Now, the idea is that when, you're looking, when your friend is looking at a picture of you, he or she will prefer the picture that is the true photograph of your face. But when you look at a picture of you, you'll prefer the mirror reverse image because that's how you see yourself. That's how you see yourself in the mirror. That's where, uh, that, that's where your self image uh, comes from. Here's an example of this. Uh, this is, of course, Marilyn Monroe. Um, and you can ask somebody um, uh, which, of these, um, uh, which of these pictures of her uh, you prefer. And what generally happens is that people tend to prefer this one to this one. Okay? And that's because there's Monroe's birthmark. Okay? That's where we expect to see it. And that's what we think is right. However, when Marilyn Monroe looks in the mirror herself, looked in the mirror herself, that's what she saw. And so if we had asked her which picture uh, she preferred, she would have preferred the reverse Marilyn. Okay? That's, in fact, exactly what happened in the, uh, in the MIFA study. Here are two studies where people were looking at pictures of themselves and um, of their friends. And when people looked at pictures of themselves, they preferred the mirror reverse image to the true picture. When people looked at their friends, they preferred the true picture to the mirror reverse uh, image. These were just friends. These were actually people that the subjects were dating. Okay? And you got the same, uh, the same effect, a really nice reversal. The fact that people prefer mirror reverse images of themselves, that is, inaccurate images of themselves, suggests, A, that they do, in fact, have some kind of mental picture of what they look like in their heads. That's the self-image and also suggests that it's derived largely from looking in the mirror. Talk about the looking glass self, there really does seem to be um, a, 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 a something like that. So here you have a, a, a demonstration that we do seem to carry around in our heads some kind of uh, image, some analog representation of what we look like, and that we can we use this kind of perception-based representation uh, to, uh, to make various kinds, of, uh, various kinds of social judgments. Okay, so that's the need to study. Now, the self-image, viewed as an image, has not been studied all that much in psychology uh, to date, though there are places where you can see it. Uh, back in the old days, when I took clinical training, one of the tests we were taught to administer and score and interpret was something called the, the draw a person technique, where you'd put down a piece of paper, uh, on the blank piece of paper, and you'd ask the person simply to, to draw a picture of yourself or draw a picture of some other person, and then you'd engage in some kind of arcane um, uh, the scoring of this. You know, if they have big feet, well, they're on a journey or something like that. Um, but the fact of the matter is that when you ask people to draw pictures of themselves, assuming 
that they're confident to ask people, okay, well, you're going to get some kind of sense of what their, uh, their image is. The problem with the draw person technique, of course, is that most of us can't draw worth a damn. Okay? So that's not a very good way to get at people's uh, self images. If you don't believe me, after class, when you're sitting uh, having, uh, having lunch or something, you take out a piece of paper and try to draw yourself and see how much you like the results. Um, it's, it's, it's not good. Okay? There are, interestingly enough, verbal questionnaires that try to get at people's body images. Uh, my, my favorite, from some colleagues of mine at the University of Wisconsin, Lauren and Gene Chapman, is the body image aberration scale, uh, where people ask, uh, are, are asked questions about, uh, about their, their, their body images. So uh, one of the sub, uh, subscales is unclear body boundaries. Sometimes I've had the feeling that I'm united with an object near me. I am the coffee cup or something like that. Okay? Uh, feelings of unreality or estrangement in parts of my body. I've sometimes felt that some part of my body no longer belongs to me. Or feelings of deterioration. I've sometimes had the feeling that my body is decaying uh, inside. Uh, perceptions in the size uh, of, uh, of, of, of body. My hands and feet sometimes feel far away. I will never, remember, I'll never forget going on a job interview once and being interviewed by a distinguished senior uh, a psychologist who I didn't know from Adam before the interview. And he looked at me and he held out his hands and he said, do you think my hands are growing bigger? Okay, I've never met you before. I don't know. You know. Um, okay, here, changes in the appearance of the body. You know, occasionally it seems as if my body's taken on the appearance of another person's body. People will sometimes actually say yes to questions like this, right? Uh, and the idea is that uh, when people say yes to questions like this a lot, okay, they have some kind of distortion uh, in, the, in, their, uh, in their body image. But probably the best way to assess people's perceptions of body image is by actually asking them to work with imagistic materials, with perception-based materials, rather than with verbal descriptions of this sort. A very good example of this uh, comes from uh, research by uh, lots of investigators now. This is an early study um, of uh, the people, the college undergraduates' perceptions of desirable uh, body shape. What is done in studies like this is you present subjects, male, female, doesn't, doesn't matter, with line drawings of uh, either male or female bodies, usually uh, attired in swimsuits, and the, uh, the, the bodies uh, range from pretty thin, really, really thin, to really, really not so thin. Uh, and then you simply ask people to indicate uh, which one uh, they resemble uh, most. So you can ask people uh, to indicate which one most closely resembles their current body, or their ideal body, or what kind of body they find attractive, or what kind of body they think would be attractive to the opposite sex, or for that matter, the same sex. Uh, it doesn't really matter. This is an assessment that is frequently used in studies of eating disorder, typically with women, but also, uh, but also with men. Here is an example of this. Again, this is from the study by Fallon uh, and Rosin. So you've got women, in case you haven't figured that out, and men uh, here, um, somewhat thin, somewhat thicker. Um, and then what you've got are um, uh, the, the point where people uh, rank their ideal body shape, the body shape they think is attractive, the body shape they think is attractive to other people, and what their current body shape is. Uh, and this study uh, reveals a very common finding in this literature, which is that for college women, uh, college women believe that their current body shape uh, is somewhat uh, discrepant from the ideal or the attractive. College men don't have this problem. Okay, um, which again I think just goes to show you the difference between your own image and somebody else's image of you, because it's pretty clear looking around campus that. Quite a few men do have this problem. Right? Uh, but here, look, you know, here's, here's the ideal. There's the current body image. There's the attractive uh, the, uh, the, uh, the body image. They're right on top of each other in a way that the average college woman uh, just, uh, just doesn't have. OK, so now what you can do is, I mean, this is a direct assessment of what people think they look like. What you then like to do is to actually get some kind of objective assessment of what these individuals look like, which is not something that you see um, uh, very often. But the point of this is simply that this is a way of getting at people's perception-based representations uh, of, uh, of their bodies. I'll skip over the generational study. This just simply shows you that uh, look at college women and their mothers college men and their fathers collecting, uh, collecting the same kind of data. Now, what's really interesting about this is when you look at clinical samples of, say, people who are actually carrying a psychiatric diagnosis of eating disorder. Here is um, uh, such, a, uh, uh, such a study. Again, college undergraduates classified as eating disordered or not based on a questionnaire known as the eating attitudes uh, uh, test. So there are women who are high or low on eating disorder. Men don't, the eating attitudes test is really geared towards women. Men don't usually show up as eating disordered on, uh, on it. They're just there for, uh, for comparison. And when you look here at the eating disordered individuals, eating disordered women tend to perceive their current bodies as quite far removed from their ideal or what they consider to be an attractive uh, body, non-eating disordered women show much less discrepancy between the way they perceive their current bodies and what they think is the ideal or, uh, or the attractive. And then men, of course, they're men. Right? Uh, but again, the point here is that in eat one of the sources of eating disorders is the perception of one's body. Eating disordered individuals, whether they're male or female, tend to perceive themselves as much fatter than they really are. Now, all you got to do is look around. You can see there's a fair amount of overweight uh, in the world. That's a major problem. So we're not talking about whether they're actually fat or not. We're talking about how they perceive themselves. These individuals are perceiving themselves, presumably, as uh, much, uh, much fatter uh, than, they, than, they, uh, than they need to be. Here, for example, is another study of body image disturbance in bulimia, um, where um, they looked at bulimic women and normal women, that is, non-eating disordered women, who were statistically matched for their actual weight. So we've got a pair of comparisons of women uh, with their actual weight. And what you can see here um, is that the bulimics, OK, saw a much greater discrepancy between their current weight and their ideal weight than the normal uh, than the women did. Again, it looks like we don't have just one body image, one self-image. We've got a couple. We've got the body that we think we have and the body that we, uh, that we want to have. Here's a very nice um, uh, example of this, where the bulimic patients show a much greater discrepancy between their actual and their ideal um, uh, uh, body image. These are all, again, equated uh, for weight. It's a very, very, very nice finding. So there are, uh, eating disorder is one place where we can see 
clinical disorders in body image, clinical disorders where people have an internal analog representation of their bodies that seems to be quite discrepant from what they're really like. And then just to go back here for a second, there are lots of places where you can see this. In schizophrenia, one of the common features in schizophrenia is a distortion in body image. Um, I've already talked about eating disorders. Um, there is a wonderful neurological syndrome associated with damage to the left parietal lobe known as body image agnosia. Sometimes in the literature you'll see it referred to as autotopagnosia, auto, self, topo, map, no, agnosia, knowledge, okay, they don't have a good map uh, of, their, uh, of their bodies. People with body image agnosia can't locate their own body parts. If you ask them, where's your hand, they can't tell you. Okay, they don't seem to have an internal representation uh, of it. Phantom limb pain also has some of the qualities of a distortion in body image. In phantom limb pain, amputees will feel pain in a limb that they don't have. Okay? So there's an internal representation of the limb, even though the limb is not uh, physically present. And then finally, in body dysmorphic disorder, uh, this is another very interesting clinical syndrome where uh, people are obsessed with uh, what they think of as flaws in their, uh, the physical flaws in their, in their bodies. My nose is too large, my ears are not even, or something like that. And what's interesting about what we call this body dysmorphic disorder is not just that the people are obsessed with this alleged flaw in their appearance, but the point is there is no flaw in their appearance. They perceive their bodies in a way that's quite different from the way their bodies actually look. Again, in these kinds of clinical syndromes, we can see uh, evidence for a perception-based representation of the self, an image or a mental picture of ourselves that represents what we look like to ourselves, what we think we look like, which may be quite different from the way we, look, we appear to other people. Okay, two views of the mental representation of the self. First, the self as concept. Second, the self as image. On Wednesday, we'll look at a third view of the mental representation of self, the self as a knowledge structure encoded in memory. See you then. Thank you very much.